Luke's all right on the other end. I'll need to share shortly. And then we are live. Marius, you're now able to share that from the Facebook uh, page. Okay. Okay, I have my operator to do that for me, so no problem. Okie dokie. Right, I'm going to start the show now, so I'll put you on mute for a moment. Okay. It's Thursday, it's 8 o'clock, it's the big metal detecting radio show. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're all fine and dandy on this lovely Thursday evening. I'm ready for an exceptionally interesting show with our guest tonight, Marius Milka, who will be with, with us shortly. Uh, but before that, obviously, as ever, we'll be going to go through the news items for the week and a couple of parish announcements. The first one being uh, Scotty B's North of Time Metal Detecting uh, Club. Uh, a couple of weeks ago on the show, as you remember, he done a um, a draw for a prize on the show. Unfortunately, the winner of the prize didn't come forward. So Scotty has asked me to run the show again. So via the North of Tyne Metal Detecting Facebook um, page, Scotty will be dealing with that this evening. And he'll be letting me know the winner of that uh, competition. Uh, additionally. We have a competition that will be going live itself on our, um, I can't remember what it's called, Facebook page. There we go. The uh, Big Metal Detecting um, Radio Show Facebook page. That will be going live tomorrow. And that competition is for uh, Graham Dempsey. Now, Graham's appearing in two weeks' time. Uh, he is the gentleman who has designed and uh, invented the uh, composite products for cleaning and uh, the wax product for, uh, the, again, the cleaning and the preservation of uh, relics and coins, etc. So that uh, competition will be going live with all the details of how to win. Um, one of each, we're on the show in two weeks, that'll be going live on uh, the Big Metal Detecting radio show page on facebook tomorrow and uh hey now i'm finally in a position where i could do the do the news because i forgot what i was doing but here we go so uh first up tonight and i i hope we've got these in the right order um myself and luke uh the first one is about the milden milden hall treasure which i'll play a track from the Legendary 10 Seconds, who we had on a couple of months ago, one of their songs, which was concerning the Milden Hall treasure. Uh, the British Museum has had to step in, in a row over the Roman hoard. Uh, basically, the hoard was found at West Row in Suffolk, but it was named Milden Hall treasure after the village's parish. And now campaigners from West Row want the British Museum to rename the finds. Uh, a <laughs> bit of... Uh, 
bit of an argument going on there. Second up this evening, uh, a lovely um, story on BBC News about the rampside Roman coin hoard, which could show a new unknown settlement. So the hoard of Roman coins could be evidence of a previously unknown settlement, historians have claimed. 21, year, 21 coins were discovered by a detectorist on farmland at Rampside near Barrow in Cumbria last year. Although the Romans were known to sail the coastline, it was not known that they actually settled on the Furness Peninsula. Sabine Skay from the Dock Museum in Barrow said a wealthy Roman must have been living here to bury them coins. It's quite exciting. The coins dated from AD 70 to AD 171 and cover the reigns of emperors Vespian, Hadrian and Marcus Aurelius. <clears throat> uh, Sutton Who, an exhibition unites the greatest Anglo-Saxon digs. Finds from two of the greatest Anglo-Saxon excavations in the UK are being brought together for an exhibition. It'll be held at the National Trust Sutton Who Visitors Centre, which uh, I believe is recently um, made um, or, or at least updated, and uh, it's now something special. Uh, this is near the burial mound in Suffolk, said to belong at King Raidwald. Basically, these um, the exhibition is going to bring together both the Sutton Hoo treasures, as well as that from the Staffordshire Horde. Um, so this is coming together very soon. And I mean, if you look on the BBC website uh, for the Sutton Hoo exhibition, which writes the greatest Anglo-Saxon digs, you will see some fantastic imagery of the time period of the finds. Uh, next up, over in the US of A, in... Wabasso Beach, a modern-day treasure hunter, uncovered quite a score on an Indian River County beach last week. Jonah Martinez, who's been combing for buried treasures for 24 years, discovered nearly two dozen silver coins from a 300-year-old sunken ship. When you pick up anything from these wrecks, you know you're in right place at the right time. Martinez and a group of friends were using metal detectors to scan Waboso Beach last Friday night when he suddenly got a hit. Uh, the 22 coins are said to be from the 1715 treasure fleet wreck involving 11 Spanish ships returning from a trading voyage to Cuba. Uh, so a, a beautiful story from over in the US of A. Finally, in the news this week, a treasure finds important to Shropshire's story. Tools, rings, weapons dating back from 2,500 years ago have been declared as treasure. An expert said one of the five halls from Shropshire was groundbreaking as it included tools from both the Bronze and Iron Ages. Peter Reval said he thought it was the first time from both periods have been found together in Britain. All our prehistoric finds are really important to the story of Shropshire, he said. Bronze Age specialist Mr. Reville said, who is the... Shropshire's finds liaison officer said the county's museum hoped to acquire the items. So, yes, uh, some fantastic bits of news this week. Um, very much enjoyed reading through them and, and catching up on them this week. And uh, I'm sure if, if you can look for yourself, you'll, you'll quite agree. Um, two other items. Firstly, uh, the Archaeology and Metal Detecting magazine. Uh, which is www.archmdmag.com, has a new page, something we've been um, trying to do for quite a while. Uh, but because of everything else that we've been doing at the same time, we've only just got round to actually publishing it. And that is an educational page, which hopefully will assist those in the learning and schools, etc., with links to <clears throat> not only um, the likes of, York Archaeological Trust, which has got a fantastic uh, thing for younger archaeologists, but also uh, archaeological kids. We got BBC links to PDF sources, uh, metal detectors for beginners at both LP and Regdens, and also several books. Uh, one of which is definitely on there called the Archaeology Fox, which was a uh, written by uh, a gentleman I got to know a few years ago called Stuart. Uh, and uh, my kids at the time absolutely loved it. It was fantastic for them to to learn about um, archaeology via this book. So without further... Oh, sorry, one more thing. How, how did I forget that? Let me just have a drink because I've been talking for an hour. The Archaeology and Metal Detecting Magazine. Uh, obviously, you all know 
that we publish up to four free magazines a year, which are cascaded through uh, major rallies and other entities. And we are about to launch issue six, I think it is, in April at Spring Detectable. Now, as you'll see, hopefully in StreamYard on the stream at some point, Luke will show you the current front page that we've got. Uh, and, and basically, this is a shout out for people who would like um, any articles published. Uh, and as I say, this goes out to quite a substantial amount of people throughout the UK. Uh, if you'd like an article to be published in it or any other information, uh, please contact us. If there's anybody wishing any advertising, please contact us for costs. Unfortunately, we can't advertise for free because we publish it for free. So the advertising sadly makes up for the um, the cost of the magazine for being able to give it to you all for free. So uh, please, um, if you'd like to consider writing for that, we would definitely appreciate that also. And I know we've got a lot of new listeners and uh, our guest tonight, Marius, we spoke earlier and uh, hopefully Marius will be putting something in or we'll be putting something on behalf of Marius. So without further ado, can I introduce you to tonight's guest, Mr. Marius Milker. Now, first and foremost, Marius, uh, can you unmute your screen on the uh, live broadcast, please? Uh, Marius is a photogrammetry and a heritage photographer, and we'll learn more about that shortly. A scuba diving explorer and archaeologist, and also a metal detectorist. So, um, Marius, how are you? Hi, uh, how are you? Uh, just to uh, clarify one thing, I'm not an archaeologist. I work with archaeologists. I'm a photogrammetry specialist who works with archaeologists. I do apologize. I do apologize. I um, Obviously, we, we've got to know each other for over a period of weeks. and um, mm -hmm. but, but obviously, a lot of the things that you, you do do are related to archaeology, as we'll see during the broadcast and hear about during the broadcast. Yes, I do work with uh, archaeologists, especially underwater archaeologists. Uh, the main one I work with uh, is Thea Katunaric from the University of Split uh, in Croatia. And I hope she's watching me right now. <laughs> so can you give us a brief introduction about yourself and, and tell us about your background and how, how you've, you've got into the line of work that you're, you're in? Hmm. Okay, my background is actually education. Uh, most of most of my life, I studied courses uh, related to education, from uh, adult education to outdoor education. And at some point, I became a diving instructor, and I've been traveling the world, diving all around the world, exploring all, the, all, all around the world, and teaching other people to, to dive, to explore, especially wrecks and other interesting things underwater. But with photogrammetry, uh, it all started from dinosaurs. Uh, because uh, a few years ago, I decided to do uh, a course in uh, dinosaurs offered online by University of Alberta in Canada. And it was a very interesting course, and I've learned a lot. It was run by passionate uh, people who know everything about dinosaurs. And, you know, half through, halfway through the course, uh, there were some interactive parts of it and so some kind of dinosaur skeletons, skulls, and they were in 3D and then got me interested. How did they do it? Did they scan it somehow? How did they do it? And later on, they started to show some kind of excavation sites and they looked like photographs, but they were in 3D. You could rotate them and this got me interested. And, you know, uh, I wasn't then thinking about dinosaurs anymore, but I was still thinking, how did they do it? And I started researching how to do it. And then I started experimenting myself. Uh, I've learned what software I needed to use, what cameras I needed to use. It took me a few years, but now I'm one of few people who can actually do photogrammetry underwater. This means scan objects in 3D. And I like it. And everywhere I go, I try to scan something. Well, from the imagery that you've uh, you've been uh -huh. sent. Well, originally, I actually found one of your images um, shared on another Facebook location and uh, shared it to the Archaeology and Metal Detecting magazine for readers to see because personally, uh -huh. I was fascinated. And and you 
noticed that I'd put it up and you contacted with me and that's where we were communicating and you've um, obviously shared other links uh, to me. So you've been in a lot of places. Uh, obviously, you're Polish, so I presume you've done work in Poland. Where else have you worked? Well, I've been uh, to... Well, I spent 10 years in the in the UK, so you know I'm also British right now. Uh, but then I left and I went to Thailand, Malta, uh, Caribbean, Bahamas, Cyprus, and now I'm in Croatia. Wow, that's uh, some beautiful. And, and I take it every diff, every area that you've been to, every different location, the uh, the surroundings under the sea are totally different. Yes, uh, tropical countries have different surroundings. Uh, Europe has its specific. Uh, waterscapes, you can say, but also specific places like when you go to Gozo, the smaller uh, Maltese island, you can see plenty of caverns, caves, uh, some kind of geological structures. If you go to Cyprus, there is more sand, for example, but they have a few wrecks and they have some ancient artifacts uh, on uh, lying on the bottom. Uh, when you go to Croatia, you have more marine life and again some ancient artifacts uh, in between, also some wrecks. And this year I'm spending on the island of Vis uh, in one of the dive centers, Nautica Vis. And uh, this is a very unique place because over there you have everything from beautiful underwater nature to uh, caverns, very nice shipwrecks, even planes from World War II. That sounds absolutely brilliant. And and obviously, you've got to be doing your work while you're there, your photogrammetry. Uh -huh. mm. Yes. Uh, I, I've been working with uh, with Terka Tunaric from um, the University of Split, and I'm trying to get involved in more of her projects, but also other underwater archaeologist projects to scan as much as possible. Because, yes, we can see they can... Archaeologists can go there, they can uh, take photographs, they can measure everything, they can do all the documentation, they can then study it for many years, but in the end, we want people to see it. And that's why archaeologists need somebody like me to be able to scan it and to show it to people who will never go diving and still want to see it because it is our heritage. Yeah. Now, would it be possible, Marius, to uh, pull up one of the images that uh, you're talking about, the 3D images? Uh, we, we've learned how to do a new thing tonight, and Marius is going to control mm -hmm. uh, the 3D imagery from, from his side and be able to show um, the, the viewers on the uh, TV show uh, what, what he actually does and, and explain a few things about it. And obviously, if anybody has any questions uh, regarding anything that they see off Marius, please shout up at any time and I'll try to get them over to him. Okay. <clears throat> I think it's almost... It's not. Let me... Ah, obviously not right now. <laughs> ah, okay. Now. So we, we just have to... Am uh, I sharing anything now? Not at the moment, no. Uh, yes, I think I so. Am. Yep, here we go. I so, am sharing something. Can you just describe to us exactly what what we're seeing for, for the listeners' reasons and obviously okay. for the viewers as well? This is an ancient shipwreck. This is what it looks like. It's uh, in Croatia. It's near a small island of Szczedro. And it's been there for over 2,000 years. You can see the amphoras. They are made of clay. Each one is around 50, 60 centimeters tall. This is the scale over here. I can zoom it in. So you see this rod, this stick, right? Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, because now I don't know what you see. I can only see <laughs> what I'm describing, right? Yeah, I can see so that. This, you, is, your this, is two around, meters, yeah. this is two meters long. Wow. Okay, so each section is 20 centimeters. I'll zoom it out a little bit. So you can see how big these amphoras are, right? Around 60 centimeters each. Mm -hmm. And there is a few hundred of them. Now, what are they doing in the middle of the sea? Well, uh, it's not really the middle of the sea. It's quite close to the island. Uh, although the specific location is kept in secret because nobody wants them to be stolen. Obviously. 
because uh, one of them is worth a lot uh, and there's like a few hundred of them right now mm -hmm. you can see them in the shape of a boat right yeah and this is unique that they are still showing us what the boat looked like if we zoom in especially in this section you can see this hasn't really changed for the last 2000 years right so it's like rows of amphoras on one side here yeah and rows of amphoras on this side normally they were put vertically one on next to another and then on top in the in the spaces in between there was another one so that was a way of packing the the, the boat really well and even when the conditions water conditions were bad and the whole boat was shaking they were still vertical but obviously when they landed on the bottom and the the, the wood has been eaten by all the creatures that live there obviously they collapsed but they can still see the pattern now many of them are i can see you can see untouched some of them are a little bit cracked broken some of them are really broken here but here in this place this is quite interesting when i saw it for the first time i didn't know what it was so that's why i asked our archaeologists archeolog uh in that in the roman times the boat the the boats they used for transporting them for us uh, they were quite basic so they didn't have this part what, what do you call this part uh, at the bottom of the boat it's sticking down like a like a fin right what yeah. do you call it uh, huh? I, I can't think <laughs> yeah yeah Mind that, that thing uh, yeah. so they didn't have it normally it's it's there in the modern boats to make sure the boat is stable but they weren't stable so when they were transporting uh, amphoras that were empty, they were so much lighter and they were affected by wind. And it was very difficult to steer them. So uh, when they had many empty amphoras, they just put rocks inside of the amphoras, small ballast stones, really. Mm -hmm. And these are the ballast stones that were kept in the amphora. But other amphoras have uh, plugs you can say and there is still something in them probably wine apparently these amphoras were used uh, were used to transport wine right so plenty of wine you can say uh what else i can show you here <clears throat> and where would that be coming from um you know where, what, what would be the likely route of the vessel well that's that's something we don't know yet uh, but on Szczedro itself, the small island, there was a Roman villa. Uh, a Roman villa. It's not like a, just a villa. It was a villa of, uh, that had farms, slaves, and, right. and, and, and people working there. So it'd be, be like were, what, what you call in the UK a, a manor house, and then obviously everybody... Yeah, like went, a manor yeah. house, yeah, with, with everything around. Yeah. And... Uh, I also have a photogrammetry of this villa. I can show it later. Uh, so probably they had some kind of exchange with this island, but perhaps this 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 boat just was sailing next to the island when it sank. We yeah. don't know that. Uh, but so, the, the, it's, I'm glad you asked because these days, when when you go to a supermarket and buy a bottle of Coke or something, you have a label on it. On yeah. the label it says, says where it was manufactured yeah now on amphoras somewhere on the rim they have a special stamp now we will be looking for these stamps at the end of the year because we are going back there to explore more and we'll be trying to find as many uh, as many stamps and amphoras as possible to see if they had one point of origin or many points of origin oh, so that way we will know because there are special databases. Uh, yeah. One of the best one, as far as I know, uh, is uh, created by the University of Southampton that 
uh, has um, shapes of the amphoras because right. shape is unique. So we can recognize which century the the, uh, the amphora is from by the shape of it, and then using the stamp from catalogs of known stamps from different parts of the ancient world, we can discover where the ship was going or where it was coming from. I'm with you. Now, they'd obviously, the amphoras themselves would be sailed uh, mm -hmm. and, and there'll be no, uh, that'll be well gone. 2,000 years is a long time in the sea. But will there be any uh, substance within the amphoras that be able to be tested to discover if there was anything else other than wine in them? Uh, yes, there will be probably chemical analysis done, but first we have to go back to the wreck uh, because at this stage we focused on scanning it. It took us something like 12 dives to scan the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest challenges was also for, for Thea to first gather enough money to create a special cage that will cover this uh, wreck. It's just been put there, so the wreck is safe. It's mm -hmm. covered by a special metal cage, so nobody can dive there and steal anything when we are not there. Yeah. And when we come back, we'll open it, and again, we will be using special hoovers, you can say special vacuum cleaners, Yeah. Uh, to remove the dust. I've sent you a link with this vacuum cleaner before, so maybe this is something you can show. And I will stop sharing screen. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, uh, one of our uh, list, uh, sorry, viewers, Sid Perry, he asks what depth the wreck was actually at. It's forty-five meters. It's 40, but gosh, that's deep, isn't it? And well, yes, but but there are other wrecks sometimes that are, the that are deeper, and this is really difficult to get to them. Huh? Yeah, but forty-five, you can still dive to. Yeah. One question that I had, I've, I've wrote down myself. I'm making a few notes throughout the show. Was about different laws in different areas. Uh, how how much does it differ the laws of the sea between the UK, Croatia, Cyprus, and the Caribbean? Well, uh, depends what you're talking about because uh, as Ar a diver, archaeological, archaeological and diving laws. Well, uh, diving, uh, yeah, diving is a form of recreation. So almost every country allows diving now. In some countries, everyone can dive. In some countries, you can only dive with a local guide mm -hmm. uh, from a local dive center uh, because they want to protect the heritage. They want to protect the reefs. There are many, many reasons why they want to do that, and I understand it. I normally work as a diving instructor and dive leader wherever I go, so it suits me because people will pay me to go diving with them. Uh, when it's about uh, archaeology, uh, to be honest, I don't really know because uh, at the moment I'm really focused on uh, Croatian archaeology, and I work with archaeologists, so they all do uh, they, they they all do everything legally. They deal with every permit permit everything they need to do. All I have to do is to scan it, and this yeah. is uh, this is it. But one of the biggest problems is people looting this heritage from in different parts of the world. Treasure hunters who just want to take it for themselves, not to put it in the museum. And and this is this is important to understand that this is even if you find something like that, this is not yours. This belongs to every every single one of us. So it it should be somewhere in the museum. Mm. But in this case, it will not be in the museum. It will stay there. But there is a plan that in a few years, it might be open for recreational divers. Obviously, they will have to be led by a specially trained guide, perhaps an underwater archaeologist to show them. Mm -hmm. But the plan is to open it in the future, if possible. Uh, we, we're currently viewing a video, and I presume mm -hmm. it's of the same site. Yes, this is the video made by uh, our friend uh, Wojciech Jesnak from Poland, an excellent underwater uh, filmmaker. And he went there only to actually film this wreck. And you can see all the marine life on it. And this is another discovery that after 2000 years, these are not just broken amphoras. 
they are full of life and there is plenty of interesting life on it there are plenty of creatures uh, so when you just go there you enjoy it it's like diving on the reef mm. it's a fantastic video it really personally i have never scuba dived uh, there's there's places in the uk that i I'd, I'd love to see uh, certain wrecks that i know of uh, one particular in anglesey mm -hmm. um it's something i've never done i've i've never i've never been in the position where i've been able to 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 try it and so it's, you, uh, you, you are now in the position you can just visit me in, <laughs> in this and we can we can teach you i can teach you no absolutely I, it, I it's, can it's teach you from you zero to hero no problem it's something that you said to me when we uh, discussed this a couple of weeks yeah. ago is that you would actually hopefully get more people interested in scuba diving from the show mm -hmm. tonight. And just looking at that, it's fantastic. Can I ask, when mm -hmm. it comes to the photogrammetry, mm -hmm. how many images do you have to have special equipment, obviously? And how many images do you have to take? How long did it take you to create that 3D imagery? Uh, no. It's good to have a good camera, but the, the model you've just seen, it was done with two GoPros, right? Two people were scanning at the same time, and we took over 2,000 photographs with wow. GoPros during a 25-minute yeah. long dive, and that's the result uh, of this scan. You obviously you have to use special software to process it later. It takes sometimes weeks to get the effect you want. Uh, so this was done only during one dive that was 25 minutes long. Now, uh, two months later, we did a series of dives, like 13 dives, 12 dives, I don't remember, when we took uh, a little bit better, better cameras, compact cameras with external lights, and I'm still working on that model. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's almost ready. It's like 10 times more detailed, and you can see most of the fish, crabs, and the marine life that was standing still while we were taking photographs. So that's that's the detail you can get. And when it's available, I'm sure I'll send you a link so you can share it with with everyone. Oh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. And and it had a, a lot of good feedback as well by the magazine. It had a, a hell of a lot of uh, people actually view the uh, the 3D imagery that um, I put on. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, you know, that that will work for yourself. Now, you, you've actually got a Facebook group uh, which you put all this information on for people to see themselves. Um, Facebook group. I have a Facebook page, yes. Um, yeah. yeah, but we have groups, people who deal with photogrammetry, especially underwater photogrammetry. We have some groups on Facebook. Yeah. But there are not many of us uh, because it is so much more difficult than photogrammetry on land or using a drone. Yeah. But um, what's your um, your actual facebook page called so um re uh, well, viewers and listeners can can obviously i think i think you can share it my page is just my name really mario schmilka photogrammetry for science heritage and business yeah and i'm on it at the moment um the image at the start of the page is, is another one of my favorites that i've um i've seen and it's it's of a it's of a, a boat or a ship, uh, the main photograph on that page. And I can it's show it here if you want. It's I'd, from, I'd love you to do that. It'd be fantastic. It's, uh, I have just story. opened the file. Uh, it's it's P-31 uh, patrol boat from, uh, from Malta. Right. Uh, so I'll just load it and, and find it. So, yes, this one I, I scanned a few few years ago. That took me like two, three dives to scan it. Right. And what it's era like, ship? Is, uh, what era boat is this? How long has it been sunk? Well, it was sunk. I don't remember. Like twenty years ago, maybe. Not. Not. Oh, not old. That's really old. It was an old uh, military boat. Right. Um, navy boat and they didn't need it anymore and somebody said let's let's sink it for for divers so with the marines and the, yeah i i see so it, it, divers can dive there and it will be fun for them so over um, fish and over um which is a mm -hmm. so uh, 
rest of the area uh, for diving. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it works for marine life, and this is this is very interesting when you go uh, diving on wrecks. That apart from the wreck itself, you always find these creatures that live inside, and they adopted to living inside. And sometimes it looks funny because you know you have a fish sitting in a place that you wouldn't expect a fish to sit on, but they yeah. are there, and they don't even know that there is something wrong about it because they've always been there. Uh, let me just quickly load the. And this is off Malta, did you say? Yeah, it is. It is Malta. It's between Malta and Gozo. Right. Very close to a small island called Comino. So, of all the places that you've dived, Marius, uh -huh. which is the most memorable for yourself? Uh... <laughs> I don't really know. Well, uh, Egypt, for example. Egypt is very good because you can see both uh, wrecks and you can also see uh, plenty of marine life, especially turtles. I love turtles, so uh, so maybe that one. Okay, Egypt. I've loaded. Uh, I've loaded this. I'll just make sure it's working. Okay, so now I can share the screen for you. Joe you know, went to Turkey last year to a place uh -huh. called Dalian, and the amount of turtles there uh, was phenomenal. It's very well known for its turtles, and there were several varieties, and some were absolutely massive mm -hmm. just creatures. So wait, wait for for the time you go diving with me, so you will see more interesting. <laughs> Maybe not the turtles in Croatia, but then you can go to Egypt and and see the turtles there. Okay, so I'm sharing the model. I hope. Yes, we can see that fine. So this is a nice model. And unfortunately, it was too dark inside to scan it. I didn't have enough light, so I only scanned it from the outside. And the amount of detail, it, it's absolutely stunning. You know, uh -huh. even where the, the, the bollards, where the changes to hang from, and it's absolutely uh, perfect. Yeah, well, it can be a little bit more detailed. At the moment, I've just loaded a low-quality file so I can quickly yeah, yeah, yeah. rotate it for you while we are talking live. But it can be a little bit more detailed. So when you're a diver, you can just get into this hatch yeah. mm. and swim inside all along the wreck. Every few meters, there is a hole, so you can always escape if you have to. Mm. And you said this is a PT boat. It's a, it's called P thirty one. It's a patrol P31. boat P thirty one. Right. Uh, I it, don't it, remember the whole history about it, but uh, it was just sunk for divers when it was not needed anymore. The the detail is just absolutely. You can you can see the barnacles. You can see the uh, mm -hmm. the the growths on the ship. Uh, the ladder. The steps are perfect. I mean, is even. Uh, a doorway I can see where you're hovering over now, and you can actually see through to the other side. Well, like it, in this Brilliant. place, you can actually swim through it. Yeah. Let's swim through it. <laughs> and you are on the other side. So, so this is how it works, right? Uh, Adrian Gaylor asks, how long did it actually take you to, uh, to, to do this, this um, imagery? Um, well, I scanned it on during two dives, and I had most of it. But then part of it, this part in here, was missing. Mm -hmm. So I had to go on another dive and, and scan it again. The biggest problem there was every time I was there to scan it, it was quite busy because there were many local diving schools bringing their divers to the same wreck. And I ended up uh, removing plenty of photographs because there were divers on them. There was always somebody in front of the camera. And that's why I had to go for the third time to just take photographs of the parts uh, I didn't have from the first two scans. And it, was this using a GoPro again? Yes, this one was sh shot with a GoPro. As you can see, not a big problem. So GoPros are quite good for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you know how to do it, because 
it's not that simple that you go there take photographs put it in the software and it does it automatically if it yeah. is so simple everyone will have done it right it's not about reading the instructions it's more like a form of art and it's it requires plenty of patience trial and error and and learning from others as well mm -hmm. which in this case is difficult underwater because there are not many people doing it yeah well i um i shared the link to your uh, Facebook page onto the uh, big metal detecting radio show and the archaeology and metal detecting magazine group and page. So uh, for anybody who is interested, then you can pop onto there and find that. And and via that, you'll find links to numerous other um, of of the the, um, the imagery, the photogrammetry as well. There's other um, other other things that you've done. I, I noticed uh, there, there was. I presume it's nothing of not in the sense of archaeology, but there was a few of animals in off the coast of Thailand. Am I right? Yes, but they were they were uh, sculptures uh, yeah. sunk there for divers. Yeah. Uh, so divers can go and have fun, take pictures with some artificial sharks and other creatures. But again, the imagery of that has come out pretty clear, and and uh -huh. obviously it's. It's yourself testing your own equipment and getting used to the programming the software to be able to to manufacture the the better imagery which we've just mm -hmm. seen. It's um, do you know it's it's just something else. It really is. Uh, and, and there's obviously numerous pictures of yourself uh, also on the uh, Facebook page as well uh, underwater. Uh, some brilliant shots. Uh, again, absolutely pristine. Um, there's another one as well uh, I wanted to ask you about was the anchor in Pathos Harbour uh, yeah. in, in Cyprus. Um, tell me about that if you won't mind. Okay, uh, that's a quite interesting story because this is a place where the local dive centre has been running some introductory uh, dives for all people interested going on holiday who want to know if they want to do a course or not so you just sign up for a try dive and you go there and there was not many things that were interesting in this place so whenever something like an old anchor was found somewhere offshore they arranged it so it was uh, brought closer and they created some kind of underwater museum in that place i can share this with you i think again if you want to because i have it loaded on my screen already uh, you'll also notice uh, while you, while you're loading that up tonight's t-shirt uh, I've got on is Rutus. Uh, Rutus are actually a Polish metal detector manufacturer manufacturer. Um, so you might be interested to learn a bit about them in the future as well. Uh, fantastic! I, I use one, and there's several members of Team uh -huh. Rutus UK in in behind the scenes here tonight. So tell us about the anchor that's uh, up in a everyone could see now okay can you see it right yes again the yeah. graphics are fantastic uh-huh so this anchor is like a hundred or 150 years old and you can see in here this is a tube worm it's wow. <laughs> a kind of worm that look like a palm tree right if you come closer it will hide into the tube so yeah. this one yeah. hid into the tube so you cannot see it and yeah, you can see rust in these places. But I uh, like the chain the most. Oh, that's it's... lovely. It's even so... got the rust as well, the discoloration yeah. of the rust. Uh, so. Okay, maybe there are some questions from the viewers, you know? Yeah. Uh, I don't want to be talking all the time, maybe. You know. <laughs> Anybody who does have any questions, other than myself and, and Luke, uh, you've still got a share screen on it. You can see all sorts yeah, yeah. of other I'm things. There. But if anybody does have any questions, please ask away. Uh, either inbox myself uh, or they'll pop up at the bottom, hopefully pop up on the bottom of the, uh, the broadcast, and we'll ask that straight away. Um. I wanted to also ask about metal detecting because uh -huh. you said you've done metal detecting in the past and yes, a lot uh, of the listeners tonight are metal detectors too. Uh, metal detecting I did, I started in Poland when I lived in Poland 
and it's uh, it started with some kind of cheap Chinese metal detector. And for me, it was all about searching for treasures, not really finding them, because I've never found anything interesting. Uh, but there is a big difference uh, between metal detecting in Poland and uh, in the UK. The difference is, I would say, two world wars, because in the UK there were there was no land invasion, so you don't have landmines, grenades, ammunition, anything like that. So it's quite safe to do metal detecting in the UK, while in the rest of Europe, uh, especially in Poland, wherever you go, you keep finding things uh, that might be potentially dangerous, and many times you end up calling the bomb squad. Mm. Uh, to get rid of it, and it is a normal thing, I would say. Uh, do, um, have you detected out, out, outside of uh, Poland? Well, when I lived in the UK, uh, I also did some metal detecting uh, with some local farmers. Uh, once I found half of a coin uh, that was like a 200 years old, and once I found some kind of transport tokens. All right. I guess they were they were used as some kind of uh, tickets back then. I don't know what what they were for, but mm -hmm. they look nice. So that's all I've ever found in the UK. Mm. Um. Well, I and have in, a question for Croatia. Sorry. I, I can only tell you that in Croatia, for example, metal detecting is forbidden for for normal people. Only archaeologists, protection can, can can professionals can use metal detectors. Right. Uh, it, as far as I know, it has something to do with with the the number of treasures that's been stolen, looted, and it had to be banned because too many people were just taking it for themselves. I'm with you. I'm just right. I'm just penning down some questions as I go because I got some coming through. Um, John Cooper asks, "What generally would be the price of lessons for those interested in um, in, in learning how to scuba dive?" Uh, if you've never scuba dived and you want to do it somewhere in Europe, not necessarily in England or or, or Scotland, because uh, I don't know the prices. But in in the warmer part of Europe, it's usually from 350 to 400 euros for the first course, and everything is included, like equipment, instructor, books, everything you need for the course. It takes four to five days because you need to do some practice uh, in shallow water, sometimes swimming pool, sometimes shallow bay, and then you do four to five open water dives where you dive to. 18 sometimes 20 meters depend on the course you're doing i'm with you um scotty b asks what is the most unusual find uh object and uh sea mammal if you've come across while diving sea mammal well i've seen i've seen dolphins underwater so uh in egypt so there, there's that but the most strange object <laughs> I found. Well, when I was in Cyprus, uh, I dived in one place all the time uh, because I had plenty of people trying for the first time and doing some basic courses. And after a while, I got used to the fact there was some ancient broken amphoras or, or medieval broken amphoras. So it was normal. The status of them was you can you can touch them underwater you can look at them but you cannot remove them because it's it's illegal and the local archaeological museum didn't want them because they had better ones already right so there were plenty of them for us but one day in between i noticed something strange that for me looked like an egg like an alien egg you know like you like in these b-class horror films there is some kind of egg with uh, with some strange alien symbols. So I took a photograph of it and I emailed it to every single archaeologist and uh, underwater archaeologist I know. And some of them didn't know what it was. Some of them told me that the symbols were, were not alien, but they were uh, Ottoman, so Turkish. Uh, but they didn't believe them anyway. Uh, but in the end, I sent the photographs to the local archaeological museum and they said, okay, uh, 
take it out, bring it to us. We will, we will examine it because it looks interesting. I took it. <laughs> they spent some time looking at it and then they concluded that it was uh, some kind of a grenade from the medieval times. Uh, but uh, it was made of clay, very, very hard clay. They didn't make them of metal back then. But what was interesting for the people from the museum was that that was the first one they've ever seen that was made of clay because they thought all of them were made of uh, glass back then. And they already had a few of them made of glass. So just accidentally, I I happened to found, uh, find something very, very interesting. And it was at the depth of, I don't know, five meters maybe. They even gave me a special certificate that they brought something to the museum. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm a, I'm I think still... I have a photograph of it here, if you are interested. Yes, please. And I can, then I can share the screen again. Um, let me see, share the screen. One of the uh, Matt Old Detect B asks, would the technology that you use actually mm -hmm. work in murky UK rivers, for instance? Well, yes. Uh, most of the time it's possible to take photographs. I mean, you can still get the shape of the object, but obviously with limited visibility, you will have to take photographs from very close. That means you have to take probably thousands of photographs. Mm -hmm. But if the water is very murky, this is probably the only way to see the whole object by scanning it part by part and then rendering in the computer to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, it wouldn't be like photo quality because each photograph would have probably plenty of dust. So you would see the dust, the, the, uh, th this dust on, on top of the photograph. You would see it in, it would affect the quality, but you would still see it well. Okay, so this is my alien egg. Can you see it? Not yet. I'm, I think I'm sharing something. Am I not? Ah, okay. Okay, now I'm... So this is the egg. And unfortunately, it was a Turkish grenade. Oh, yeah. So so this is uh, Ottoman in... Yeah, this is Ottoman. And has it been explained actually what it is? Yeah, it's a grenade. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> And are, we, are we talking a modern day grenade, or are we talking? No, 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 like like modern grenades, but right. they were they were like this back then. Wow. Again, fascinating. Um, underwater archaeology, it's it's a lot of things that people don't see, um, especially the likes of that. Mm. Okay. Uh, an another is... question. Yeah. Another question we have from Steve Pettigrew. How, what what is the maximum depth that you've been to uh, doing the work and diving and such like? Uh, Sixty meters. Mm -hmm. Sixty meters is the, the deepest. Have you ever been in a position that you've had the bends and you've had to decompress? In? Well, I never had the bends, uh, any bends, uh, because uh, I, when I dive, I make sure I'm. Uh, very conservative with with, with diving so yeah. i always stay a little bit longer at certain level uh to make sure i don't come up too quickly right mm -hmm. i always have enough air to stay longer have more stops on the way and that way i've managed to avoid any problems mm -hmm. uh somebody i didn't quite actually cut ca ca catch the name uh, he said he, he Croatia is absolutely gorgeous place, and he now lives yeah. in Martinique. And uh, again, the diving there is fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But but I'm I'm sorry about the pronunciation here. Batlamij Bartniki asks: Is it common to secure ancient underwater artifacts in the same way against animals or environment? Mm. I don't quite understand the question. Yeah, sadly, uh, no, no, do I. Is it coming to, let me just try and re uh, because put it into the, the, the cage I mentioned before it's against people, right? Yeah, so we don't want anyone to steal anything. And 
uh, animals that live there. I think they are the part of this. It's it's very nice to see that our rubbish, let's say, because in the end, amphoras is like rubbish. Huh? Mm -hmm. They are somehow used by the by the creatures there, and they made their homes inside. Mm. Now, as a metal detectorist in the UK, we've got a big problem with what we call green waste, which is um, a lot of mixed rubbish in the ground when you're metal detecting. And obviously, it's a big thing uh, throughout the world at the moment about uh, waste in the sea, mm -hmm. i.e. plastics and such like. Have you seen any major differences regarding that? Yeah. I can. Uh, has it got worse or has it got better? Well, it's, it's worse, I can see. Wherever I go, even on the reef, huh? I always find rubbish, huh? plastic bottles, plastic bags, and they are especially dangerous in the ocean because animals there don't really know what it is and they try to eat it. For example, mm -hmm. if you see a plastic bag, like you can get from any supermarket in the UK, uh, in the water, it will look like a jellyfish, especially for yeah. a sea turtle that can eat it. So almost on every dive i end up uh, picking up rubbish and taking them back uh, to land but they know plenty of more rubbish will always get in the ocean anyway and if you actually see my scan of the roman wreck you'll see that even on an ancient uh, wreck you can find a plastic bottle and a glass jar yeah there and i put the markers on them so if somebody is is looking at the scan now using one of the links you provided they can see that even in that place you can find rubbish mm. uh what other questions have we got um that's deep underwater do have you ever used any underwater de metal detector or, or scuba detector or anything like that no 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 uh i didn't but i worked with this underwater uh vacuum cleaners to discover some pottery yeah. uh, when I worked uh, on Shedro and uh, Hvar Islands in Croatia with underwater archaeologists. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's quite fun. Uh, you know, it slowly uncovers something that's been there for thousands of years. And then uh, I can actually show you another model. I just need to load it. Well, we've actually been asked, uh, would it be possible to see the imagery of the B-24 bomber? B-24 bomber, I don't have the scan yet. I'll be scanning it this year. But right. you can you can probably play the video I showed you. And I also sent you some photographs. If you don't have them, I can show them on this side. So I'll, ju I'll just wait to see if Luke's got them. But if not, that would be, uh, I'd be very, very helpful of you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll be green screens going all pixelated behind me as well. That'll be the uh, Subutio, Subutio cloth that I've had to uh, attach to it because I was missing a bit tonight. Uh, yeah, we've got something coming on now. And this is the video. Yes, this is another video by a friend of mine, Wojciech Hiesnak, uh, who went there in 2016. This and where is, is this? Famous this is near the island of Vis, so where I will be for the whole uh, diving season. Right. This is the famous B-24 bomber uh, to South America. This is the last uh, B-24 ever built. As far as I know, it was built of uh, the parts that left in the factory. And when they needed to, to make a few more parts, somebody just uh, paid for them. Some months some families of people working there, some kind of uh, fundraising was organized so they could finish this last bomber and send it to war. And in a way, this bomber, as far as I know, is used by Americans in, uh, let's say, propaganda or something, because this is a famous bomber. And in 1944, it was coming back from, from a raid in, in Germany part of Germany that is now part of Poland. And it was, as far as I remember, initially going back to Italy, but because it was damaged on the way, they said land in Vis, but it couldn't land in Vis and it ended up uh, in the water, like 40 meters underwater. That's 
absolutely stunning. Um, please send my regards, especially to uh, your colleague who's done these videos. They, they really are fantastic. And these, uh, we, we watched it, Nautica Diving Centre. Yeah, Nautica uh, on video. Diving Centre. It's on... Yeah. Uh, on... We, ha we, we work with them. They have uh, dive centers in this and the other island, Hvar. And yeah, if you are a diver or if you want to be a diver, you can come and do a course. I'll be working with them this, this season because they were very helpful to us with this whole uh, archaeology project. They actually rented plenty of equipment completely for free. And they organized at least two boat trips for 20 kilometers each uh, to 20 kilometers each uh, to actually help us to get there and, and do the scans so yeah they are really good you know i've just pulled up a map while we've been talking so i actually know where this is and it's uh am i right in saying it's off the coast of croatia in the adriatic sea opposite italy yeah yeah you can it's this is this is the uh as far as i remember the biggest no, not the biggest. The 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 island which is the furthest from uh, from land, right? So, uh, yeah, the last of the of the inhabited islands, you can say. You. And you get there from Split by ferry. There are two or three ferries every day, uh, so not the problem really to get there. Uh, you can come to Split by one of the cheap airlines. It's also not the problem. You landing split airport from there you have a bus bus goes to the ferry terminal and from the ferry terminal you have a ferry so mm -hmm. very easy to get to uh, to the island and then you can enjoy also everything that is on land you don't have to go diving because there is plenty to see on land some ancient ruins ancient uh, graves uh, caves caverns forts nice towns even Mamma Mia 2, the film, the movie was, was made there. So, for some reason, I that's very that. important, like, by, 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 by very, uh, uh, for very tourists, uh, for, for many tourists. So, we, we've got a question, and, and I yeah. think it's an exceptional question, to be honest. Uh, this of Jimmy Rourke, uh, he knows a lot of war wrecks are designated as graves in the UK. Is this the same worldwide? Uh, depends. Uh, for example, the all the wrecks in Vis. I've sent you a few uh, photographs before. I don't know if you can show them. Uh, as far as I know, every single wreck in Vis is somehow protected. It's it's uh, heritage. It's classified as heritage, but you can still go diving there as long as you don't pick up anything, don't break anything. You can just go there, take photographs, enjoy. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Croatia wants um recreational divers to come to the wrecks and see them as long as they don't damage them in any way even this b24 bomber a few people died on it uh, so when it was discovered a few years back uh, americans came to uh, pick up uh, some bones of the pilots and 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 crew members and then it was left open for everyone who wanted to enjoy it. Oh, this is Evelina uh, on the screen. I can see. Right, this is yeah. This is Evelina, marine biologist, who is working with me and taking nice pictures of of the creatures that uh, live on the shipwreck. And you can see um, for us also Evelina. She has a nice hood. She's a professional. And that's me taking photographs of of the wreck that's also me now i, I think i've got this right uh, if i share screen uh, -huh. uh i'll be able to show what i'm seeing is that correct well yes so if I but go when to you photo, press the button, I, I've I don't know I've used it I've never used it before. But if I press share screen button, I have to choose which window I'm I'm sharing with. Right. So I think yes. can, can we see any images that I've got up at the moment? Yeah, I can see I can see one of the wrecks. As Marvelous. you can see, it's beautiful. So I'm just I'm just trying it from from my end as opposed to uh, obviously 
Oh, that's stunning. That's absolutely fantastic. And, you know, we have wrecks that are at 10, 20 meters, so they are accessible for beginner divers. We have wrecks that are accessible for advanced divers, so down to 30 meters, and for deep divers to 40 meters as well. Yeah. If somebody wants to go beyond that, if they do special courses, they can go like me to 60 meters or deeper and even go to wrecks that we have at 70, 80 meters. Yeah. So uh, I think I'm, 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 I don't know if I'm actually doing this right. Uh, let me just go want, back and see. If you want, I can share a few photographs from here. <laughs> so no problem. Is it this... Uh, this this image that I should be showing now, it, it's art. It's something that I'd have on my wall. It's absolutely stunning. The, the way the water ripples above. Mm -hmm. And this is this is normal for people who dive in caverns and caves. This is what it looks like. In some places, you can actually surface in a cave, which cannot be accessed uh, in any other way. So you have to go underwater for a longer distance to be able to get into the cave, for example. Yeah. I've been in caves like that. There are a few of them in, uh, in Europe and all around the world. Yeah. But around these, you can see these. This is, these are great. So uh, again, I've, I've pulled up another one. Um, tell us about this rack. OK, which one is it? I'll just double check if it is Teti. I think this is Teti. I don't yeah, know all yeah. the history about all the wrecks yet, right? Yeah. Uh, I'll know more when I start scanning them. But this is one of the wrecks that is uh, very shallow, you can say. It starts from 10 meters, I think. Mm -hmm. So really, beginner divers, even divers that are learning how to dive, can go and dive around it. Yeah. It's not, it's not a problem. The two people on the photograph, are they the, mm -hmm. uh, the type, like power? The propellers that they use in there to get them there quicker yeah they 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 have uh, dpvs these are like we can say uh, civilian torpedoes we had to remove the warhead but well <laughs> at least we put some batteries and now it runs for a longer time and you can reuse it so no problem uh, yeah. you can do a course how to use it uh, in a day i think or two yeah, but some it's not mandatory to use them. You can just dive, right, without it. But if you want to go along a wreck, then, and you want to explore a little bit more, then you can always hold on to a torpedo and just go. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. I've got obvious. I've downloaded the images now. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as I said to you earlier today, I was in work, um, not able to download them to the computer and whatnot, and. Yeah. It's the first time I've been able to see them properly, and I'm going to spend a lot of time going through them tomorrow. I think it's uh, kudos to you, uh, Marius. Absolutely fantastic. Um, these Luke, these photographs are from again from Nautica Vis. Most of them were taken by uh, our friend Piotr Stuls, who manages the center, and he said just show them, no problem at all, right? And so yeah. I'm showing you the best things we we have on this because I would really like people to just go there and see this island. Yeah, yeah, especially yeah. underwater. Do you know? I think it's uh, it's probably Croatia. It's um, I don't know much about Croatia. The, the the most I know about is Suka, the old football player. Um, they play in red and white. You know, it's that's that's about my most I know about Croatia. It's one of the areas I've not looked into, but. Mm -hmm. Historically, it must be fascinating. There must be so much going on there. Yeah, there are plenty of big islands, small islands, and plenty of archaeology, like left there in between uh, towns, in between villages. You just go in the middle of nowhere and you see some ruins that have been there for many years, like thousands of years. Yeah. And you can explore them, you can take pictures. It's just amazing. All the roads. Uh, some kind of uh, old graves, uh, buildings. Mm -hmm. It's all Roman Greek times, so it's it's really fascinating. It certainly is. It's uh, and, 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 and the climate, you know. Sorry, 
the climate, the, the weather is just, and the, the views around, you can see, it reminds me in many ways, Scotland, but with better weather, you have, you have mountains that stick out of the sea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, Marius, um, tonight has been an absolutely eye opening for myself. Um, certainly if I go on holiday it, sooner rather than later, I'm, I'm definitely going to try scuba diving if just for the, the opportunity I've, I've done, um, submarine trips around um where was it grand canaria uh mm -hmm. looking at the, the the submarines and such like there but i think seeing it and being able to touch it would be a, a an experience that shouldn't be missed really mm -hmm. so, so uh come, I'll have, come visit these between let's visit. say may and <laughs> october and then we can we can go diving. i certainly love to do that it's definitely going on my um bucket list so anyway, uh, Marius, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you, to learn more about photogrammetry, uh, to see your scuba diving uh, images, to see the 3D images. And as I say to people who, who do want to learn more about his work, and, and obviously he's going to be putting a lot more on, so be able to follow his work, you'll be able to find the link on the um big metal detecting radio show facebook page for mm. marius milker photogrammetry for heritage science and business um and and i'm sure marius you, you wouldn't be uh would not have a problem with people communicating with you if they've got any other questions that they think of in the future mm. or about traveling to viz even no problem they can send me a message i will have will be happy to respond fantastic uh well as I say, um, that's going to be the end of the show for ourselves. Uh, I, I've got so many more questions I'd like to ask, but um... well, I can I can stay longer, no problem. <laughs> Honestly, as long uh... as there is anyone watching, I can still talk. <laughs> Luke's got issues on his end with the computer. Ah, and we can we can manage there. without him, as you can see. So no problem. <laughs> Uh, well, and also we've we've got to be uh, I've got to be careful of my speaker as well, uh, my podcast account. Keep an eye on that as well. So, honestly, we, we, if you'd like to come back in the future, we'd love to have you. Uh, I'm sure viewers tonight have definitely seen something that they probably not seen before, and uh, it's been fantastic. So, I can't thank you enough for coming on tonight, Marius. I'll be happy to, you know, to talk to you again next time. So, no worries. I can maybe, maybe when we finish uh, the next stage of the. Uh, of the research on the ancient uh, shipwreck, then we can talk again. At That'd the be end fantastic. Of the year. And Jean Queer to your uh, friend, just to your left hand side, who's been dealing with things behind the scenes as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I work with a lot of Polish people, so I picked one or two things up. <laughs> so, uh, Marius, is there anything else you'd like to add before I, I put you on mute and end the show? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for listening. And and I hope I will see you in this. I, I would love to. I really would. So that was tonight's guest, ladies and gentlemen. That was Marius Milker. And I've been absolutely fascinated at every single thing I've seen tonight. Uh, a couple more things before the show ends itself. As I mentioned at the start of the show, North of Time Metal Detecting did a competition a couple of weeks ago. Uh, sadly, the person who won it didn't get in contact. So Scotty's contacted me, and the winner was 237, Nick Britton. So, Nick, if you could contact Scotty B about your prize, that would be fantastic. Additionally, he would like everybody to know over half the tickets have gone in two weeks to Detecticon, so if you are interested to go to Detecticon, please buy your tickets sooner rather than later uh, to be guaranteed a place at Detecticon, where we will be playing, and the magazine you saw at the start of the show will be available for free. Uh, next week, big, 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 big show. Uh, somebody I know you're all desperate to hear from, uh, and, and I'm certainly looking forward to asking him many more questions than what you'd think, and that is Mr. Mark Betcher of Metal Detectives and Detectable. So uh, greatly looking forward to speaking to Mark next week. Uh, we'll keep you updated on all things metal detecting, Obviously, via our 
big metal detecting radio show page, the Archaeology and Metal Detecting Magazine group, and our hourly news broadcasts, sorry, hourly news reports via the Archaeology and Metal Detecting Magazine page. Please have a look on the website. We've got lots of new things going on there with more going on soon. Uh, www.archmdmag.tv for your Netflix type history and YouTube videos. And I've actually typed everything out tonight before the show so I can do a, a thank yous as well. Obviously to Marius tonight, but to Southeast Metal Detecting Rallies, Leisure Promotions, Treasure Hunting Magazine, Regtons, the National Council for Metal Detecting, Facebook Groups, North of Tyne MDC, Finder Field MDC, and Metal Detecting Britain and Beyond. From YouTube, South Coast Detecting, Steve Pettican, Diggers, Dirt Diggers UK, Scott and Kimmy. Got it right, results. That's Brad, Digger Dawn, Addicted to Bleeps, Anglo Celtic Metal Detecting, and John's Detecting Adventures. And individuals to Tony Kaywood, uh, to Gary Cook, and to Gary Blackwell, and especially to all the people who are active in the group and the listeners and viewers to the show. I'm going to end tonight's show with uh, a song, The Jewel of Mil Middleham, in relation to the article we ran earlier. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dave Sadler. We'll see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.